Well, hello, everyone. My name is Larry Foley. I am chair of the School of Journalism and Strategic Media at the University of Arkansas, and I am uh, proud and pleased to be able to moderate a, a panel of such uh, distinguished uh, leaders. Uh, we're going to begin with having each member of the panel introduce themselves. First, we begin with uh, Senator John Bozeman, the senior senator from uh, the state of Arkansas. Senator Bozeman, good to have you with us. Well, thank you, Larry, and thank you for allowing me to participate. And I want to congratulate you on the great work that you do at the University of Arkansas. We're so proud of our department and the tremendous job that they do. So I'm uh, one of the senators from Arkansas. I grew up in Fort Smith. I'm a fifth generation Arkansan and now live in Northwest Arkansas in Rogers. Uh, but it's a real honor to represent the state. Uh, and uh, again, in, in to be part of the panel today. Thank you all for all that you do. And I'm really looking forward to talking about the value of communication. Certainly in the world that I live in, uh, I, I understand how important that is. Michelle Duke, you bring a, a, a different perspective than just Arkansas centric. It's good to have you with us today. Uh, introduce yourself if you would, please. Um, thanks so much. I'm so glad to be here. I'm, I'm not uh, from Arkansas, but I am from um, your neighboring state. I'm from Tennessee. So I'm not, I live back and forth between Tennessee and DC and I'm glad to be here. Um, I am the president of NAB's um, Education Foundation and NAB is the National Association of Broadcasters and I am the Chief Diversity Officer for NAB have worked in, in journal, um, journalism and then, you know, essentially media for about 25 years and uh, done diversity work in that area for about 20. So thanks for having me. Thank you. Look, Story, it's good to have you with us today. Well, Mr. Foley, it's great to be, it's great to be with all of you. And um, uh, my name is Luke. I'm, I'm fortunate enough to lead the Arkansas Broadcasters Association. And our association is an alliance of nearly 300 member radio and TV broadcast stations uh, united to serve their audiences throughout the natural state. Um, we do a lot of advocacy for our member stations. We offer help with the FCC. We provide scholarships to aspiring young young media professionals. We host career fairs um, and we represent the industry uh, both in DC and uh, here, in, here in the state. And uh, we try to help our members uh, embrace the changes that are coming their way. So this is kind of a, a very fortuitous uh, panel to discuss. So I'm looking forward to it. And Wendy Guerrero, you are a president of the Bentonville Film Festival. Nice to, to see you today. Thank you, Larry. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, right. I am not an Arkansan. Um, I was born in California, but I do come to Bentonville area in Arkansas at least once a month. So I feel like I'm creating an, an affinity with the rest of the Arkansans. Um, so I run the Bentonville Film Festival and Foundation. We are a platform that champions inclusion in media. And we've been doing this for the last five years and we've just seen it grow. Um, and we just finished our sixth year and we usually bring over 65,000 people to the region every year. So I'm excited to be part of this discussion. Thanks for having me. Thank you, good to have you with us. Eddie Vega, you are owner of Easy Spanish Media. Uh, tell us a little bit about you and, and, and what that means. Thank you, Mr. Foley. Uh, well, as you said, my name is Eddie Vega and I'm the owner of Easy Spanish Media. We own radio, Spanish radio stations in the state of Arkansas, Northwest and Central Arkansas. And I, uh, we moved from California 27 years ago. And uh, we can hear you. Keep going, Eddie. Well, well, we'll get back to Eddie when he clicks back on. Uh, we also have with us today uh, Dr. Jared Cleveland, who is the superintendent of Springdale Schools, a very large district here in uh, Washington County. Uh, Dr. Cleveland, nice to have you with us. Thank you very much. It's, it's great to be on with such a distinguished panel. I'm an educator, uh, and uh, educators really have to have a great art of communication. It's very important. However, I don't do it for a living like you all. So it, it is a fantastic opportunity to get to listen and learn from you today. And, and uh, I'm just honored to be here with you. Thank you. 
Well, thank you all for joining us. Let's begin, uh, Senator Bozeman. Uh, the COVID uh, pandemic has just turned uh, the state and the country and, and the world upside down. And it's not only created all kinds of, of health challenges, uh, but it is also just made a mess of trying to communicate messages. From, from your post uh, in Washington and also representing Arkansas, uh, you have various constituencies. Uh, what, how have you handled the challenges of, of getting the right amount of, of uh, information disseminated and out to folks? It, it must be uh, not, not a daily, but maybe an, an, an hourly nightmare trying to, to muddle through this to make sure that, that we have the information that we need and then it's uh, accurate and getting communicated in the right way. Well, Larry, it, it is really very important. And certainly my life, like everyone else's life, has changed dramatically. And the way that we do communicate, it's difficult. People generally will, will come together if I ask them to, and yet I'm very hesitant to do that because of the fact that I don't wanna put them in a difficult situation regarding uh, you know, the spread of the disease. So I've done lots of Zoom calls, lots of telephone calls, much more than normal. And I think what we're doing today is a good example of that in the sense of, you know using this sort of, uh, of medium. Uh, there's been a lot of tragedy that's come out of COVID. On the other hand, I think a bright spot is, is utilizing this technology. Uh, people are reluctant to change, change is hard. Uh, broadband, I'm a co-chair of the, the Senate Broadband, Rural Broadband Caucus. And so I think those things are gonna be great for Arkansas as we make it such that with telecommuting, telemedicine, uh, telelearning, all of those things are, are on the cutting edge right now and are going to continue to get better as we go forward. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Luke and Eddie, I'm going to call on you next. Uh, I read something uh, not long ago about how much uh, folks are really leaning on local media and, and at times specifically broadcast media to really understand what's going on. Uh, we're not talking about the cable news networks. We're not talking even about the networks. We're talking about local television stations and local radio stations. Uh, how important, uh, Luke, first, and then we'll go to Eddie, how important have our local stations been in getting the word out to help people uh, maneuver through this difficult time? Larry, that's a great question. And I think the right word is essential. And our broadcasters have done a phenomenal job of stepping up to the plate when a lot of our young people who are our, our audience for this particular panel, their lives were completely uprooted. Uh, they missed out on proms, they missed out on graduation. Some of these milestone life events uh, for these young people were, were put to an end. So broadcasters stepped up to the plate and, and fulfilled their mission to their local communities by saying, let us, let us use our bandwidth, let us use um, our resources to provide you. It may not be the same, but we're gonna recognize these young people for their accomplishments. We're gonna host, you know, we're gonna host a prom over the air. Radio stations hosted on-air proms. Uh, our television stations um, recognized the graduating seniors. Um, and, and it was just a time, it was really kind of a, uh, kind of a unique time for us to be able to show what we're capable of doing. And I think what makes this even more, um, even more impressive, in my opinion, is like some of the other essential services and businesses, um, there were record revenue losses. Uh, and with us, we're a fixed, you know, we're a fixed business model. And with all those revenue losses and uh, there was a profit decrease, we never stopped creating content, serving our communities and really um, providing these people with um, not only vetted, truthful information, but uh, some of this uplifting content that they so, they so drastically and so desperately needed. Thank you, Luke. Eddie, are you back with us? I know that the Latino community in Arkansas, especially up here in Northwest Arkansas, has been especially hard hit by the COVID. How are you um, uh, dealing with the message to, to your audience? Yes, sir. Well, as we all know, COVID has affected 
mostly everybody and you know uh broadcasting is not the exception it it affected us too initially in a way that all of our djs are doing their shows since april from their homes but you know as as uh you know that radio stations and tv stations are essential in this time in any time of crisis and we have been fortunate enough to be able to help the community with thousands of PSAs, public service announcements, telling people what to do, how to follow the guidelines, giving updates, daily updates on what's going on with COVID, uh, giving updates from the governor's office, from the Arkansas Health Department. We have uh, people calling from, from those places every day, giving information out to our audiences. And we have radio stations in, uh, Northwest and Central Arkansas, where most of the Hispanics live, and uh, it, it has, you know, the mostly affected Hispanics and the Marshall League community in Northwest Arkansas, and uh, I think that has to do with with our race, you know, not nothing else, and uh, a lot of, you know, Hispanics uh, are diabetic. And that's one of the things that, you know, this virus affects the most. But we keep on giving information every single day uh, about what's going on on the community and what to do and what not to do. Thank you, Eddie. Uh, Michelle, talk to us about uh, the, the national perspective and, and uh, with a little bit of a, an eye on uh, diversity. We know that uh, certain demographic groups have been harder hit by COVID than others. Uh, Arkansas is certainly uh, in its own unique place. I believe, unfortunately, we're number eight in the country in per capita cases of uh, COVID. But how have you guys been been crafting the, the message uh, from a national perspective with an eye on those diverse uh, constituencies? Well, NAB has been working with, and, and, you know, I should back out and start by saying that, you know, NAB, as you know, um, and if you don't know, for the audience, represents uh, free over the air radio and television stations. And anything that we do um, is done um, or is polished, if you will, by, by the sheer volume of our membership and their willingness to really serve the community. And so we've done a number of PSAs um, that have been distributed nationally and that our members have run. And so those very, you know, educational tools have been um, very, very good. And I would say in terms of getting the messaging out in terms of what to do, very similar to what Luke said in the community and, and protecting yourself uh, from COVID. Uh, that said, you know, I would like to echo what, what Luke just said as well around um, broadcasters, both radio and television, and Eddie, you, you said this as well. They're always there in times of critical need. They're always out there willing to, in some instances, even put their life on the line to get the story to the general public, to protect the public, and to serve the community that, that, um, where they're based. And so we've seen a lot of broadcasters, both radio and television step up to the plate. We're inundated, frankly, with stories every day of the great work that they're doing in their communities in terms of getting the word out and partnering with government agencies to, be, to ensure that the messages are clean and concise and accurate. And so I think at the national level, you just see what Eddie, um, you know, as an independent, you know, as a, as a station owner and Luke representing the state, has just been amplified at the national level. We do what we can to support all of the state broadcast associations and all of the broadcasters. Thank you, Dr. Cleveland, uh, Springdale Schools, large district. I don't know if there is a community harder hit by COVID than Springdale, Arkansas. Uh, and you have various audiences that you must serve. You have your educators, you have your students, you have the community. It has uh, no doubt been a great challenge on, on how you, you guys have been handling the COVID and the dissemination of information. Would you talk a little bit about that, please? Sure. Well, you know, we have our communications director, which is Mr. Trent Jones, and 
and he has a spider web of influencers in the communication realm, like Mr. Vega, like uh, Channel 5, Channel 40, all of, all of the uh, other stations that are up here at KNWA. So the partnerships that we have in getting the information that we are, are gathering and disseminating with those outlets have been critical. Now, we've also been using our social media outlets and our, our YouTube channel and all. But having accurate, timely, authentic, and multi-language communication all at one time is a really difficult challenge. You know, our, our Marshallese community, our community, and our, and our overall general population in groupings. I think we have around 60 or so home languages spoken in our district of 23,500. So making sure that our information that we gather is accurate and manageable and translatable is so important. Uh, you know, as, as we began to, to step into a COVID-19 situation in March and students go home, our efforts were to really communicate on an individual level with moms and dads and, and students. That was hard. I mean, it was really hard. We learned so much. And now that we've gone through the, the summer and begun the face-to-face the -face instruction and the, the uh, multi-level instruction of where you can, students can be here on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, or completely virtual. You know, we've got roughly 4,000 students that are totally virtual. Communicating through uh, instances like we are communicating today is vital in having those broadband uh, access points and links is critical. I and mean, Senator Bozeman mentioned that a little bit ago. Arkansas is a very rural state and it's hard for everyone to have access. You would think in Northwest Arkansas, where we're told that streets are obviously paved with gold, paved with gold up here, which is not true. And that we're all rich, which is also not true. We have over 70% free and reduced lunch children in our, in our community. Our focus as a school district is to partner with others out there. We have great partners that uh, are majorly focused on making sure our students in our public school, which is the great equalizer, by the way, where all boats can rise in the harbor with an education, have access to their education. And we've known for a long time that, that uh, the focus of authentic communication is how students are connected to their learning. So thank you to our partners out there. Thank you to Senator Bozeman and certainly Congressman Womack for helping provide those access points. Our governor, who's done a, a really good job this year of helping us uh, through the CARES Act monies develop uh, some additional communication opportunities with computers and with access points and hotspots and all. But to drill down to what I think your question was asked about, COVID-19 has impacted the health of our people, all people in our community. And our focus is to help uh, their children, all children have connection to their school and to the opportunity at learning. And all of you on this screen have had that wonderful opportunity to learn and to grow yourself and to grow and, and now be leaders in your area. So we want our children not to have a major gap and an educational gap and a learning gap. And right now, sir, I fear that everyone who's involved in any kind of education anywhere is working to try to fill a gap that we obviously know exists. And so uh, the communicators that are out there, the authentic ones who are, who are really trying to do what's right for every child, like all of you on this screen, I appreciate that. And we in Springdale are going to do our dead level best to make sure that the gap for all of our children is not wide and that we can recover it and, and fill it quickly. So certainly thank you uh, at our faculty meeting on Friday, uh, we talked once again, and we've talked about this before about how in, in this time we can engage our students, even when we don't have the physical touch of being face to face with them. Uh, Wendy, talk about the Bentonville uh, Film Festival, uh, because I know that film festivals, I know this because I have a film that's out there uh, this, this, uh, uh, this fall, uh, have really been challenged that you've all gone virtual. Uh, so I'd love for you to talk about how you've handled that and, and also talk a little bit about um, uh, your focus on diversity and inclusion within your film festival, and that'll move us into our next topic. 
absolutely happy to, to share. Although um, entertainment is not an essential, I do feel like there's never been a more critical time, you know, to celebrate cinema and its ability to get us through extremely challenging circumstances like now. So cinema keeps us entertained, informed, and inspired. And um, we at the Bentonville Film Festival have a mission to make sure that those stories of underrepresented stories are, are out there and people have access to them. So we had to reimagine the whole festival this year because of COVID-19. So we, we were challenged with being, you know, in, in, inventive. We, we did do everything virtual. We did all of our panel discussions and happy hours and film screenings on a, a streaming platform that um, if you were a pass holder, you had access to. So we, we looked at this very optimistically. And even though there were a lot of challenges with presenting the festival this year, we had a lot of engagement and we did reach out to a lot of the organizations that have been talked about on this call to offer access because we we do believe that you know the students in the area should be able to access the stories and the inclusive stories that we're representing in the the festival so gina davis is the co-founder of the bentonville film festival and she really founded it um, after she had a child and she started watching entertainment for her young daughter and seeing the the over-sexualized and hyper-feminized um, characters that were in some of these animation shows um, that she was watching in children's entertainment. So she started an institute called the Gina Davis Institute on Gender and Media to study gender depictions of women and girls in media. And out of that came the need to understand uh, depictions of culture and race in media. So then that's why we started the Bentonville Film Festival. And its focus is to champion underrepresented storytellers. So we just finished our sixth year. Uh, we had more than 30,000 people join us on the streaming site because we were mainly virtual. We did do some drive-in activations at the 112 drive-in, which were really successful. We had family nights there. And then we did one in-person event at the Louise Thaden Airfield. Um, so we were kind of a hybrid this year and we probably will be uh, continuing into 2021. So we'll see how long um, COVID keeps us from gathering. But uh, like I said earlier, I do feel that cinema and entertainment are essentials and um, we want to provide access to, to all to see themselves reflected in media. Uh, thank you, Wendy. Uh, Michelle, I'm gonna to turn to you now. We hear lots about diversity and inclusion uh, and, and those are buzzwords that, that are being thrown around a lot today, but not since what I would say would, would probably be the height of the civil rights movement have we seen so much focus on the message uh, certainly spawned uh, to a great degree from what happened with uh, George Floyd. Uh, do you think that this, uh, that this has an opportunity to be a new tipping point for folks to just do more than just talk about diversity and inclusion, but to really uh, turn this into more of a, of a culture of, of understanding uh, what our problems are and, and, and to seek solutions? Absolutely. I, um, you know, and I, I know I answered that fairly quickly, but but I've had a lot of time to think about this and reflect on this in terms of um, the difference with what's going on right now versus what I've um, seen over the 20 or so years that I've worked in specifically diversity as it relates to the media space. Um, for a long time, it, did, it felt like it, Groundhog Day. Um, uh, we would have, you know, meetings and the brightest minds would come together and, and everyone would have sincerity and there would be a multicultural room and you'd have the leaders there and you'd have the, uh, the tree shakers there and others who, who had key points to make around why diversity was important for our industry. And then we'd come back together maybe five years later or maybe I would just show up five years later because I felt like the conversation might be the same. Um, and it would be the same conversation, but the difference now, um, 
and and not to go back to your first point around around COVID was that COVID um, for the world was somewhat of a levelizer. Um, it it just brought home, I think, for all of us, our humanity. And because we were at one point in time, kind of, if you will, sitting down um, and with more time really to look at, um, back to the earlier point, local media or listen to the radio and familiarize ourselves with what was going on, not only in our community, but what was going on nationally, this particular story um, resonated. And um, as a result, instead of a lot of conversation and or some of the same recruitment tactics, um, retention tactics that we've been at for a long time, and don't get me wrong, they work, they work, um, but the needle was kind of slowly, if you will, moving. I think what we see now is um, a sincerity um, and an urgency around um, systemic change, which means we have to dig a little deeper and, um, and be a little more strategic around how we approach our diversity, inclusion, and equity initiatives. Understanding um, with the baseline, with the baseline that uh, diversity in a sheer definition means everyone is, is seated at the table. It's not just about people of color. It's not just about women. It's not just about LGBTQ. Um, it's, it's about everyone having representation, which leads into equity and also making sure you have an inclusive environment. And so, yes, I've, I've seen a bit of a shift um, and um, hope that we can build on that momentum uh, with what we do to try and attract um, you know, um, diverse candidates to our industry because that's a long going been a goal of ours and a mission. Thank you, Senator Bozeman. At, at times in, in recent months, the rhetoric has been, um, it's been difficult to, to listen to and, and to watch. Uh, but but at, at times, do you feel like uh, that it, at times it, it may take something that inflames to get people to pay attention to the issues uh, when we're talking about uh, folks who are underserved, folks who, uh, uh, you know, may have issues that, that we just, you know, in our day-to-day -day lives don't pay much attention to? Senator Bozeman. Okay, I'm back. Okay, there uh, you are. very much so. And yeah, uh, I've got my technology back and, and figured it out. But yes, uh, very much so. And, and you know, I was sitting, I was looking at the panel and, and listening to the stories. And, and I think uh, you know, this is a pretty Northwest Arkansas centric panel in the sense of uh, those represented. But when you look at, at what we've done in the last 30 years regarding inclusion, I think we can be very, very proud of that. And uh, as was, was told by our great educator in Springdale, who's doing a tremendous job and has big shoes to fill, which he's doing very, very well. Uh, you know, the key is, is getting people the education that they need. When I'm in the classroom, I, I ask young people what they want to do when they grow up. And, and it's the whole gamut, you know, somebody who been one of a doctor, a nurse, or, uh, you know, a plumber, a fireman, everything you can imagine. But I know that, that sitting in the Springdale schools, because of the education, because of the hard work that's, that goes on, they'll have the ability, you know, in other words, they'll have the education that they need to fulfill those goals, which is so, so very important. So I'm really proud of what we've done. We've got a long way to go. I think that we've got a national focus now that we need to take advantage of. I know you at the University of Arkansas are doing the same thing. And it's just everybody working together. And, and really, Larry, the bottom line is when it gets down to it is, is you get back to basic truths, you know, taking care of people the way you'd like to be taken care of, you know, just in a, these basic truths that we simply have to get ourselves back to, and in some cases, you know, moving into. But yeah, I think it's a great opportunity for us. Thank you, Eddie. I want to turn to you uh, and have you talk a little bit about the, uh, the, the Latino community as, as far as being included in, in the world in which we live. 
uh, in the 27 plus years that I have been a full-time academic, I've seen an evolution uh, and I, I've, I've noticed this, I've paid attention to it where the first number of years, I didn't really have any uh, Spanish speaking students or, where Spanish was their first language. But, um, but that's changed and it's rare when I don't have that. And some of them come from uh, Northwest Arkansas. Uh, I think back on a class not too many years ago where I had three students, none of whom were born in the United States. And I think about what's happened to those. One is a main anchor in Tampa. Uh, another has an executive position at Crystal Bridges Museum of, of American Art. Another is a, um, is a bilingual anchor and reporter in Milwaukee. And I'm just so proud of them. And I think that, you know, to see them come through our program and get the opportunity um, just makes me burst with, uh, with, with that every once in a while, we may ought to look at, you know, we are making some progress in some areas. Talk to me about, about your audiences and, and what you were seeing as far as the evolution of, of your folks who will listen to your stations? Well, when we first moved to Arkansas 27 years ago, there was 20,000 Hispanics in the whole state. Now there's 232,000, which is 1,160% more in just under 30 years. I mean, this has been growing tremendously. And I think with the new census coming up, it's going to show that it's a lot more than, you know, those uh, numbers. On uh, broadcasting ownership, I think minority participation, it's very limited. In 2005, I became the first Hispanic to, to be a owner, you know, I, to, to have a license in the state of Arkansas 15 years ago. Now in 2020, I'm still the only Hispanic to hold a radio license in the state of Arkansas. I, I, I was the first one and I'm still the first one and the only one as of today, you know? And I think that needs to change. You know, it took me over three years to get my first radio station. I mean, it's, there was a lot of hurdles and I, I did go through a lot of different things to get my first radio station. And uh, after that, I mean, we own several radio stations now, but we still are the only, or I'm still the only Hispanic in the state to hold a, a radio license. I think uh, in, in broadcasting, we need to improve. We need to do a lot more. We need to give more opportunities to those that want to get into broadcasting. Thank you, Dr. Cleveland. I'm going to turn to you. The Springdale schools are very diverse. Uh, Marshallese students, Latino students. Uh, how are you guys handling uh, diversity and inclusion? Because, uh, you know, if you take a look at, at different school districts, they wouldn't be as demographically diverse as you guys are. Well, we're, we're just open to everyone. Dr. Rollins, the former superintendent, he was here for roughly 40 years. He would always espouse, Jared, it's every child is every child. All means all. And we continue to do that or live that mantra. Uh, we are a direct reflection of the community that we serve every day. And just like Senator Bozeman said, as far as treating one another as we treat ourselves, that's our stance of making sure that every child feels accepted and included and valued and there are so many different arrays of children in, in their thinking and thought process. It's not just a matter of color of skin and background and history. Uh, it is a, a conglomeration of all that. Think of, a, think of a choir, think of a choir. If everyone sang bass, how, how weak would that choir be? It'd be really cool if it was just bass. But if you have all of the different levels and all of the different um, qualities of, of the choir, now you have unbelievable harmony. And, and that's what we believe our school and our community and all, our culture of Springdale is, is a beautiful choir with unbelievable harmony where everyone is important, everyone chips in, everyone is valued and, and believed. And 
and our, the lens of each culture and each person that's involved in that choir in our school and our community makes us so much better together than we would be alone. You know, so I always say this, collaboration trumps oscillation every time. So if our community can collaborate together, it is going to be so much more rich and valuable. So diversity and inclusion, yes. Our communication team, we have so many different uh, groups in our communication team that help us see through a more clear lens because of the value that they bring from their community, from their background, from their history. You know, if it was just me by myself, I would fail. Absolutely. And if it were just you by yourself, each one of you on your screen, you would fail too. The value that others bring to you and with you not only help you uh, develop your own personal psyche and skill, but you also, with that diverse and rich background of others, help everyone move together in such a unique way that, that I think is really an example for the country. Springdale, I think, is an example for the country when you look at, at uh, the leaders in the community, like Mr. Vega, who's on this screen, who has been a, a uh, well, the tip of the spear, if you will, to help bring that richness, that culture forward. And, uh, you know, we're all proud to be from Springdale. And we want to make everyone on this, on this screen proud because of uh, the partnerships that have all come together, regardless of background. Dr. Cleveland, I'm going to have you, uh, I'm going to ask you another question here. Uh, we've often heard it said that, that, that the way forward is, is paved with education, however we want to define it. Uh, you've devoted your life to education. Uh, I, I'm guessing that you absolutely believe that. I do. There's no question. Uh, you know, had it not been for an ed education, a formal education, I wouldn't be here today. But education comes in many different forms, right? My grandfather was a barber and maybe one of the smartest men I've ever met in my life. In fact, in Logan County, Arkansas, if you wanted to be elected, you had to get your hair cut in, in his uh, barber shop. And my grandmother was a beautician and they shared the same kind of shop with a fake wall that went down through. And her name was Vestal Cleveland and she was the kindest human I've ever met. Uh, they had a different kind of education and yet instilled in my brother and me, and of course my, my dad and his brother, they instilled in us a core value of hard work and care for one another. That's, that's basically where I am today, a core value of hard work and care for one another. What's new to me in Northwest Arkansas is the cultural perspective. Where I came from in Logan County was a relatively homogeneous group. So I have grown in my leadership and my understanding and, and, and the value of education by having the other cultures infuse in me. And I've been able to be that snowball rolling down the hill that just gets bigger and bigger and bigger because of the, the investment that others have, have made in me. But education, regardless of your perspective, regardless of your station in life, uh, is a constant and you have to be a constant learner. And if you're not, uh, here's a saying that I really like. If you're green, you're growing. If you're right, you're rotting. And, and I think that's important in education and all throughout your life. If you ever get to where you're right, uh, Mr. Foley, I think that's a problem. You're going to be on the way down the hill. Well, I can tell you from my own perspective, the older I get, the less I know, and, and that, that's at least one realization. Uh, Luke's story, I've been in broadcasting for more than 40 years, and, and there's so much I don't know, and I'm, I, I know that here in Arkansas, we've got a number of really fine programs that, that graduate folks and, and get infused into the broadcasting world. Uh, but you guys uh, invest in scholarships in Arkansas, so you certainly have a commitment to uh, investing in the education of our young folks. 100%, and I will preach it from the highest mountaintop that those investments are the greatest investments we make year after year. And they're mutually beneficial for, for the young people and the aspiring uh, media professionals, but also the more established uh, professionals that are our members because uh, our ultimate goal is that um, the, the return on those investments will be those people entering the workforce and, and working here in the state and working for our members. Um, you know, we've, 
for decades, I guess Trent and uh, Trent and I've had the pleasure of working on this particular festival. Um, we contribute to the financial backing of this. It's been an absolute pleasure getting to get more involved in the actual organization and, and the concept building of it. Uh, we've also made some investments in the Skills USA program, where those are those are our opportunity to. I mean, of course, we're we're giving scholarships to those uh, aspiring per young people that are in the college ranks, but we're also trying to um, dig a little deeper and reach those uh, those young people that are in high school that uh, have that have the have the brain that we can kind of, you know, help develop a, a clear understanding of what our profession actually looks like at a younger age. Um, so sponsoring those events, making the uh, scholarship investments, um, uh, it's the best investment we make year after year. And uh, like you said, it's, it's so fulfilling when I get a letter from a scholarship recipient and they tell me, you know, where they're at now and, and the success of their career and how much the scholarship meant to them. And it's just, it, it's so fulfilling. And it's actually, it's, it's nice to see um, those young people go on and, and accomplish their dreams and have uh, us have just a small part in that. Michelle, talk about the national perspective. How, how important, how absolutely necessary is it for us to maintain a focus on education as, as the light ahead to get us past some of these things that keep holding us back. Well, it's absolutely important. And, and we do a number of programs similar to what um, is being done at the Arkansas uh, Broadcasters um, Association. We um, offer training for, um, in particular, in a couple of areas for women and people of color. There, there are areas where we have um, lots of employees, but not much diversity. And so in sales um, and in engineering. And the reason I want to touch on that is because I know we're talking about communication. I spent a lot of time as a newspaper reporter when I, I told you earlier, I was, I was from Nashville, um, Tennessee. And um, so worked at the Nashville Banner, which was a daily news. And they offered a minority youth program. And that's really how I got my start in this, in this business, in this industry. And so while I was in school, I was very fortunate to be able to, to, to do work um, at the collegiate level while I was in school. Most students, and, and I didn't know anything really about what was going on on the other side of the, the building and sales and certainly at the broadcast stations, not in engineering. And um, and so it's a twofold process. One, educating students about the fact that there are in, in, on camera opportunities, um, you know, before the microphone opportunities, but then there's a ton of opportunities behind the, the scenes, accounting, HR, marketing, sales, engineering, or the industry is so all encompassing. And so we offer programs to students about those opportunities. We also partner with the Broadcast Education Association on career fairs that um, feature um, individuals such as yourselves coming out to speak about their careers in the industry and then also having the opportunity to interview for uh, career opportunities. And then finally, I want to go back to something that, that um, Eddie mentioned in terms of uh, ownership in the industry, a program that we've had for about 20 years um, that someone that's in the audience right now would have to kind of work their way to, but certainly should keep in the back of their mind is our broadcast leadership training program. It trains um, women and people of color to move into radio and television ownership. And we've had great success with that program, about 325 grads and over 50 of whom have moved into uh, station ownership. And, and Eddie, um, you, you know better than all of us on this call how difficult that can be. And so we're, we're very proud of those numbers, but I totally agree that education is important, it's critical, and information, which goes back to the whole um, of the conversation around communicating um, uh, information, if you will, uh, that's accurate uh, to students uh, so that they understand that uh, what's, what's available, number one, they, they, may, they may only know what they see. They only hear what's on the radio, or they only see what's on television or what's on cable or whatever show they're watching on Netflix 
um, or on, on their smart device, um, then they, they may not be aware of all that goes into making that come to fruition. And so I think that our responsibility here is to provide them with that, with that detail. Well, Eddie, I want to turn to you now. Education is weighed in, differently depending on you know, how you want to look at it. Uh, when I'm out in the community, whether I'm on the golf course or whether I'm in my neighborhood where there's a building going on, uh, I hear your radio, radio stations playing and they're listened to by uh, carpenters and by plumbers and by electricians. So, so you, you guys, uh, you, you have a little bit probably different audience than maybe others have, but uh, these are skilled workers. How do you, how do you uh, look at your message to those folks? Yes, Mr. Foley, we are fortunate enough to have a big audience. We have a very diverse audience within our community. I mean, we can probably say that we are the only radio station that we have listeners from 12 years old to 64. You know, most, most of the radio stations have the 18 to 24, the, you know, they're uh, different uh, people that is listening to them, we, we have a very general audience. And as you mentioned, uh, a lot of our listeners are, you know, the, the workers, you know, going out on the field. But as you mentioned before, too, our, you know, younger kids, uh, just, just going back to Springdale, the Springdale, the Springdale School District has almost 50% Hispanics on their student population. All of those students are going to local schools too. I mean, they are going after uh, higher education. That's why you're seeing more at the University of Arkansas and NWACC in the education has been a part of uh, this community. I, I've seen the education being a very fundamental, no community will succeed without proper education. We know that. And the uh, Northwest Arkansas has done a great job with the no kid left behind policy. They have done tremendously well. Uh, Dr. Rollins did a great job and Dr. Cleveland is following that, that legacy. Uh, he has the vision and I know that he's working really hard to get it accomplished. Uh, those three uh, students that you mentioned, I know them very well too. They uh, they are part of the community. They you know they were born. Uh, we could say they were born in Northwest Arkansas, even though a couple of them came when they were really young. But uh, as those three, we have doctors, we have uh, engineers, uh, we have students uh, becoming professional at all levels and it, that's it's very satisfactory seeing that in our community because i was here when you know when we don't have that and mm -hmm. seeing these kids grow up and get getting this type of education and and coming back to the community and helping on many different ways and and influencing other kids to do the same it's it's very I mean, it feels very good. Thank you. Uh, Wendy, as, a, as an immigrant to Arkansas, one who runs a film festival, uh, you know, with films put together by artists, uh, what is your view of, of education as we look forward? Well, absolutely. Access and education are really important components of any film festival. Um, we not only do the celebration of um, inclusive filmmaking once a year, but we also have a year-round educational program that we um, invigorate students locally and nationally. Um, we partnered with Coca-Cola Foundation for eight female directors to be mentored for one year. So they get to shadow other directors, meet major studios. Um, and so Coca-Cola Foundation gave us a big grant to do that. We also do a lot of work in the community. Um, Springdale High um, had a, a film that they produced and made in our regional reels program. So we, we really wanna highlight access for regional filmmakers and how 
um, we can provide more opportunities for people who want to get in the industry. Um, we also work with a lot of interns from other organizations um, like Latinx Theater Project and other um, community organi organizations there. Uh, we took one of our programmers to Sundance this last year. So we're just kind of, you know, opening up as, as Michelle was saying, many of these people might, might not even know that these opportunities exist to run a film festival or to be a programmer at a film festival. Um, you know, and there's a lot of on-camera opportunities too, but there's also the behind the scenes. So there's the cinematographers and casting directors and, um, you know, all the other jobs that go into movie making or into making a film. Um, it's just giving people those opportunities so they even know that those jobs exist. And they're really fantastic jobs with, you know, high paying wages and, um, you know, a lot of the benefits for um, insurance and things like that. So one of the things that we do at the festival is really highlight those areas where people can see themselves growing into. Um, we also partner with a local studio here that just opened called the Farm Studios. So we want to bring more filming to Arkansas through the festival. Um, a lot of our alumni come out and tour the area because they say they want to shoot a film here. Right now we have a lifetime film shooting at the stage in Hiawassee. Um, we just shot two pilots uh, over the summer that got one of them got picked up by Peacock Network. So we'll be coming back to the region to shoot um, you know, 10 more uh, episodes of that pilot. So it's really coming into the area, not just as a film festival that is celebrating cinema, but also as, uh, as a, a job opportunities and job trainings for, for local people um, to learn more about these, these jobs and to bring growth to the region. Thank you, as we wrap it up, I'm gonna turn back to you, uh, Senator Bozeman. Uh, you know, you have uh, devoted your life and uh, your career, whether it was playing football or moving into the medical profession or, or being a public servant to the state of Arkansas. I have uh, dedicated a, a good hunk of my own life uh, as an educator and as telling the stories of Arkansas with, with sort of a focus on, you know, the 25th state is a pretty special place even though we have some things in our past that, that have not been uh, real pretty. But uh, I'd love for you to wrap us up today talking about your view of the future of Arkansas and maybe compare it to the way you might have looked at it when you were a kid growing up in Fort Smith. Well, Larry, thank you so much for the great work that you have done and are doing and really to all of our panel. Uh, Dr. Cleveland was a little bit concerned that he couldn't communicate as well. I, I think he really summed up the education cabal so, so very well. And uh, I think Arkansas has a great opportunity. We're in an industrial age of technological revolution. In fact, the print uh, industry is a great example of that. It's probably changed more in the last 10 years than since the invention of the printing press. And we could say that the same thing about broadcasting, the different ways that you get it, uh, as opposed to, you know, the three channels that you and I grew up with where I was the remote control. You know, our dads would say, get up and change the channels. You know, and you have three, three opportunities. So things have changed remarkably. But I think in, in listening to uh, Dr. Cleveland and the rest of you all, uh, I think that's the hope in Arkansas. Uh, we are moving in the right direction. We're recognizing this change. We're, we are doing a great job. The governor is providing a lot of leadership. Our communities are providing a lot of leadership. Our educational institutions are doing a really good job of preparing young people for the age when you go into a Walmart now, there are no checkout people, you know, in, in many stores. Uh, you know, what do you do with those workers? You know, where, where are those workers going to be? And the good news is they can transition to the other jobs that are higher paying. Uh, the bottom line is we can talk about all kinds of problems in the United States. We can talk about uh, the problems overseas and this and that. If you can't make a living wage, everything else is pretty unimportant. 
And so, again, I think Arkansas is doing a great job. Certainly, uh, it is a very different world than, than when I grew up and, and uh, has really moved, I think, in the, in the right direction in that regard. We've got a lot of work to do, but I do think we can be very proud of, of, of what we have done. And uh, uh, as Eddie mentioned, you know, Springdale, 50% of the students Hispanic. Uh, that not only are we doing a good job of educating, providing them the opportunities that they're going to need in the future, but also really working very, very hard to keep them in school so that they'll get that education. So we can be proud of a lot of different things. And uh, I, I definitely think that the future's bright. Uh, if we continue to work together, uh, we'll be in good shape. Thank you, Senator, uh, Luke, uh, Jared, Eddie, Michelle, and Wendy. It's, uh, it's been an honor being with you today. Uh, thank you, Trent, for inviting me to moderate such a distinguished uh, panel. And uh, here is hoping and, and wishing and praying that the end of 2020 is a, is a little brighter as we, as we move into a new year. Thank you all so much.